winter holiday makers in the North Island, the shattered Tongariro is the rendezvous. For many families, this is an annual visit, for here there's enjoyment for all. By buses and cars, people go 2,000 feet up to the skiing grounds on the slopes of Mount Ruapehu. The keen ones head further up still to the steeper slopes where they hold their races and club competitions. You really get that old skiing feeling again when you're weaving downhill in the slalom. Yes, it's easy when you really know how, and back on the lower slopes, a party of novices are learning how. The sharp ends go first, lady. Serious skiers despise old-fashioned snowboarding. But until you're serious, there's a lot of fun here. It looks like another cold front. When you are an accomplished skier, you can pass the time doing this instead. In the South Island, the mountains are at the back door, so to speak. Here at Coronet Peak is one of the most popular of skiing grounds. Where sheep graze in summer, children learn to ski in winter. This is the time to start when you're young and supple. And here is the crowning joy of a skiing holiday. To have climbed as high as you can and have the whole world before you. To come streaming down the mountainside through the sharp, clear air and the only sound, the hiss of the hickories, as they speed over the pure white snow. So on and on till the snow ends, and the skiing holidays are memory till next winter. On the west coast of New Zealand's South Island, white baiting is a profitable and popular pastime in the early spring. Armed with their nets of various traditional shapes, the west coasters patrol the riverbanks and tidal reaches when the white baits start to run. They sit around waiting for the tide to turn. White bait are transparent minnow-like fish about two inches long, which migrate upriver in dense shoals in the spring. They're delicious to eat, and with New Zealanders, they're the most popular of all table delicacies. They're even more sought after than oysters, so when the season opens, the fishermen get good prices. Every coaster who has the time goes white baiting, for he has both pin money and pocket money. The farmer's wife combines fishing with dairying and empties her nets when she goes to bring in her cows. Be it early morning or late evening, people are out when the whitebait are running, and it takes more than the famous West Coast rain to stop them fishing. The size of nets varies from river to river, and on the Hokitika, set nets are used. It's in the far south that the big holes are made. In the forest streams far beyond the end of the road, the fish are netted in large quantities. To keep them alive, they're put into holding tanks sunk into flowing water. Here they're kept up to 36 hours before being packed in boxes and taken out by pack train.
In these inaccessible parts, this is the only way to get the fish out, across unbridged streams and through winding bush tracks to the road and the waiting lorries. To get his catch to town, an outback farmer is sending it in with the timber lorry. Small planes come to the remote landing fields to take on a load of whitebait. They fly daily over the hump of the Southern Alps to the inland towns of the South Island. Along all the rivers, the west coasters continue to reap their spring harvest. Tomorrow, boat and train and plane will again be ready to take white bait to dinner tables all over New Zealand. This is the central Otago country in New Zealand's South Island, a dry inland plateau sparsely populated by sheep farmers and their sheep. Through it flows the Molyneux, New Zealand's biggest river. There is little here to suggest an exciting past, only a few old men prospecting for gold along the water's edge. Yet once there were gold fields here whose riches brought men from all over the world. It's 90 years since Gabriel Reed discovered the first gold in central Otago and started the rush to Gabriel's Gully. His find is honoured by a miner's pick and shovel marking the historic spot. The old timers using pick and shovel and dish prospect in much the same way as the early diggers, but there are no rich rewards for them, just the odd specks of gold that others have missed. With the rewards went the hardships, as this monument reminds us. Sluicing is another method of gold winning which is still carried on in a few places. Water under pressure quickly blasts away the topsoil, enabling the miners to get at the gold-bearing soil below. Men made their fortunes from the Molyneux River, and today they're still getting gold from its bed by dredging. This huge floating structure is slowly eating its way up the river at the rate of 25 feet a day, and filling the air with the noise of groaning steel. A chain of buckets bites down into the solid bed of the river and brings up the pay dirt. This is washed and the gold collected. The control room is the dredge's bridge. From here, the depth of the buckets is regulated and the dredge moved. It can be warped backwards and forwards and from side to side. Once there were 50 dredges on the river, now there are only two. But this modern monster, which can bite deeper and operate more cheaply, is the most efficient of them all. Every week, more than a thousand pounds worth of gold is taken from the bed of the Molyneux. In the gold room, the week's winnings are melted down and cast into ingots. In the scales are gold bricks and the bank manager calculates their value by weighing them. Every day, the dredge brings up 33,000 tons of shingle. Not even 10,000 miners with pick and shovel could equal that. So the metal that brought wealth to a struggling colony is still being won. Its winning is mechanized now, but it has not lost its romance. <laughs> 